and welcome to Series 7, Episode 7 of In Suspense, a podcast and vodcast for fans and writers of crime fiction. I'm Laura North and my co-host is the lovely, lovely Leslie Cara. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Laura, and I'm glad to be back. <laughs> oh, I've missed you. I've missed you lots. Um, in our last episode, Mickey Smith and I talked to writing duo Ellery Lloyd about collaborative writing. It was a fascinating insight into how they work together. And I still can't believe that they don't have structural edits. That blows my mind. So amazing. Um, but today's episode is all about career longevity um, and adapting to the market. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, we have a phenomenal guest who is Adele Parks. Um, but before that, I must say, oh, I just knocked my <laughs> mic. In what my excitement to tell you how much I've missed you. Popped it on the floor. Um, it, it's been a funny month. I don't feel like I've seen or spoken to you, Leslie. And sometimes we speak every week. So tell me how you're getting on. Tell me whereabouts you're up to with your writing and how you're doing. Oh, well, it's so good to be back. And I, I've really missed you as well. Um, but it's been a, it, it, yes, it's been quite an intensive month for me because I've been doing a lot of writing. Also had a, a, a few sort of family issues as well, but then they're, they're never going to go away. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've, I've managed to make really good progress on the novel. I was hoping to have finished it actually by the end of this month, but because I had to go and look after my son and um baby my, not my baby well he is my baby son, yeah. but my son and his wife their baby my grandson oh my god I'm babbling I haven't done this for ages forgive me everybody I will get the hang of it again soon um yeah so I had to go and help them for about five or six days while he recovered from his op and um yeah so that kind of threw me back a bit and dad's been in and out of hospital but I have managed to get a lot done and I've got the back of it done um, and I hope to have finished her cross fingers by by de by December, by the end of December. So, which I, I feel very um, pleased about because, yeah. it, as you know, it's it's been a it's been a tough one. But I really feel into it now. I feel I've hit that midpoint. I've written the ending, <gasps> and I've 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 I'm hurtling towards hurtling towards my climax. Oh, now, exciting. Which sounds I can't terribly wait to rude, read it. it? But yes, so that's 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 what I'm doing at the moment. And also the other night. Because there was something that was bothering me. I had sort of, you know, a sort of gaping, well, not so much a gaping plot hole, but mm. something about the plot that wasn't quite working. Yeah. Because I kind of re redone the first half. I've sort of already written the first half, but I've I've completely redone it and and, and planned into, you know, got got the got the novel the structure completely right now at least I hope I have I mean my editor might have other ideas <laughs> I don't know but um I had a brainwave in the middle of the night and you know what it's like when you have them in the middle of the night and I had this idea and I thought oh my god just that solves everything and that that you know plugs all these little gaps so I wrote it down straight oh, away. Oh, God, I, I thought you were going to say you didn't write it down. Oh, no, I knew, because I know that's happened before. And you you always think, I'll definitely remember this, but mm. you, you never do, do you? So I made a note, my iPhone in my notes, I was tapping away in the middle of the night. And then the next morning, I was half dreading looking at it, because yeah. I've done that before. And you think you've had a brilliant idea. And then when you look at it, it's absolute gibberish, you know, and you think, well, I must have been drunk. What was I thinking? <laughs> But it still made sense. Um, and so that's really given me a huge boost, really, that I can sort of feel like I can press on now. So yeah, it's it's been good. It's been it's been a it's been a good month. And hopefully December I've apart from the few sort of engagements that I've got, it's authorly engagements, mm -hmm. I've kept that fairly clear as well. So I'm gonna have another a good intensive uh, writing month in December as well. So Exciting. really, really pleased about that. So what about you, Lauren? How, how are you fixed for your writing at the moment? Well, I've had a busy month as well. So I spent the last three weeks sort of frantically finishing my next LC North book, which is book two um, for me of LC North. Um, I am really excited about it, but at the same time, I know it's not quite there yet. There's like there's still some bits missing. Mm -hmm. Um, so but I've sent it actually to a freelance editor. I don't know if I said that in the last podcast I was doing. Oh, that. Yes, I think you did mention it. Yeah. Well, oh, by the way, I meant to say I loved that episode that you did with Nikki. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant, thank brilliant. You. 
Yes. I mean, it's funny because she said about how she was worried she'd made loads of mistakes. And I was like, the only editing I had to do was myself. And I was constantly <laughs> doing stuff. So my goodness, don't worry. It was completely me. I was quite, we did it really late at night. And I just should not be allowed to talk after nine o'clock at night, I think. You were brilliant. You were lovely. But oh, you're saying oh, you. that you've sent your novel off to a freelance editor. Is that something yes. you tend to do normally? No, I've never or? done it before, but it just occurred to me that, you know, all the same people have been reading my books, like my beta readers are the same people, my agents the same, my editors the same. And I just thought, well, let me just give it to someone else for a change. And um, there's this really lovely freelance editor um, and I just booked her in and yeah, so but it just meant because I tried to do that before it then obviously goes to um, my actual editor, it's, it's been a squeeze. I had to really push myself and I was quite tired last week um, about it, but it's done now. So I've got a couple of weeks off before it comes back to me. So yes, a bit of breathing space, which is lovely. How will you feel if both editors say different things though? Well, I think they'll see them at different times. So I'm, I'm just, I'll get one set of structural edits and I'll take that on board and mm. I'll get my B to readers be back as well and take that on board and then I'll change it and then mm. give it to the other editor. Mm. I, I mean, it's, I don't think it's ever things that are going to be completely fundamentally different. It is more a case of yeah. putting more stuff in, I think, rather than because it's only 70,000 words at the moment. And I know there's a bit of flexibility then to. to yes. Yeah. Do, do you do your novels tend to be 80,000 or 90,000 words in the end? Only ever 80, normally. <laughs> never go past yeah. 80, I don't think so. But the first draft's always closer to 70, normally a bit earlier than that as well, but it's yeah. shorter than that. And then it just grows with the structural edit. So I always find 80,000 is good because you know then 20,000 is your first quarter and 40, you yeah. know, know what I mean? It makes yeah. it much easier to sort of work out things. But um, I think I was asked or suge- it was suggested to me a while back that I try for a 90,000 word novel. Ooh. But I actually think 80,000 is my, it filler. always seems to be my natural length. Mm. Um, some of them have been slightly over and one of them has been slightly under that so mm. I think as long as it's circa 80,000 that's enough yeah. isn't it yeah. I think the important thing is that the story is told to the fullest isn't it like Absolutely. so it doesn't really matter if it's 70 80 or 90 because if you feel like you've had a satisfactory experience yeah. reading it but, then but well done on finishing the second um LC North book that's brilliant you you are so so, um, so brilliant, um, Lauren, you know, at getting things done. You're a real, um, are you a workaholic? I'm not yes, sure. I'm a complete workaholic. The other yeah. day when I was, um, I had to have it in by Friday and on Wednesday, I just sat for 12 hours. I didn't move other than mm. to go to the toilet. That I didn't. Mm. I, I went to the gym with a plan to work out and I didn't. I just mm. sat and sat and sat and sat until like mm. nine o'clock at night. But then it was done. And actually I didn't need yeah. to do it till Friday, but I didn't stop. I was like, no, I'm, I'm in this now. I think I am. I do have a tendency to be a workaholic. I haven't been this last year, but I was up to that point and I'm moving back into that because I am doing very long days now and not because I feel under pressure, but because I'm actually enjoying sitting yeah. at the desk and working. And I feel that particularly when you, you know, after you've hit the midpoint in a, in a draft, it, it, the momentum's there, yeah. isn't it? And you want to keep going. And I feel quite excited now to sort of sit down at the screen. So it's, it's great, you know, yeah. Yeah, but, it's really uh, yeah, so well done. Well oh, done. thank you. Topic, topic today is career longevity. Yes. And adapting to the market. Mm. It's kind of two things then, isn't it, really? It's a, it's a dual topic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, see, I, I sort of think they're a bit connected. So it do in order to have career longevity, do we have to keep adapting to the market, I suppose, is my... Interesting. Yes. Do you um, think that? Do you think that is that's that, that that's what it is? Then do you think? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's about seeing what's popular and sort of adjusting your yeah, your genre? I, I do. Or? I do think that. Yeah. I certainly think that it's a case of looking at what books are making it onto the bookshelves, mm. Um, mm. especially in the supermarkets, which just I don't take many seeing what publishers are acquiring and Mm, mm. just like sort of thinking about how you can apply that to your own work. And I think my biggest example that I've got is that I am very mindful now to have shorter chapters than I used to have. So rather than a two and a half thousand, three thousand chapter, I'm certainly now, once I get to 1200 words in a chapter, I'm really starting to try to get to a point where it finishes on a bit of a cliffhanger and move on. Yeah, Um, absolutely. Me too. I think... Yeah, I, I think my chapters vary from between sort of twelve hundred and fifteen or sixteen hundred. Yeah. 
I've got one in the the latest novel, um, the one I'm writing now, that is 2000. And for me, I think, oh, it's too long. But actually, sometimes as you're moving towards the end of the novel, when it's the hopefully it becomes yeah. you know really exciting, sometimes those longer chapters seem to be quick because there's there's yeah, a lot of really going, yeah. excitement. So I don't think it matters so much if you have slightly longer ones, you know, in the in the sort of climactic scenes, perhaps. No, uh, I agree with that. But um, yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? How you could mm. look at the market, but it's so it's so challenging, isn't it? Because you can't you can't change who you are and the kind of the style you write. But no, um, and there there is advice, isn't there, that we shouldn't necessarily write to market and that we should write what we need to write. Um, but I think it's it's a good idea to be mindful of the mm. market. Um, but yeah. at the end of the day, I think you 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 have to write what inspires you and what makes you enthusiastic. Otherwise, it will show in your writing, won't it? If you're not completely passionate about about something I, I don't think you make yeah. us fit a mold that isn't natural for us you know yeah and the and the this is interesting because there's a, quite a few books now um that sort of are pairing sort of exotic thrillers with um intense sporting things so um trans world have got the dive coming out next year haven't they which is all about scuba diving in i think yes. thailand which looks absolutely amazing i've been sent a copy and i can't wait to read that um and there was ali reynolds the bay yeah, as well and you know you could easily think oh well maybe I should do an extreme one as well but I don't have a clue about extreme anything or extreme writing anybody like I, I don't know I've, I, you do adventurous things with your children don't you you I sort mean, of go hang over rivers and things I've time. seen you I've seen you on the videos doing all that palava <laughs> I don't think it's that extreme so um yeah it, I think I could a... write a thriller about table tennis I'm quite good at Ooh, that are you oh do you know what you must come and we've got a table tennis table Lizzie. Ooh, I, I'll, well I won't I won't thrash you but what I do is I'll put Tommy in front of you and he can thrash you so good. yeah I'm, I mean I, I'm bigging myself up I'm probably not very good at all I'm oh, not very good at smashes or anything but it's it's probably one of the few things that I can do you know mm. so <laughs> yeah so um, yeah going back to the career longevity thing, oh yeah you've got to um you've got to adapt a some in some respects but you can't be who you're not you can't be someone you're not uh, and that will just come through in the writing as well I think so yeah it's, it's the balance isn't it it is. And I think but I think also for career longevity, you have to really want it and you have to be really driven. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I don't know about you. I'm enthusiastic. I'm always I'm thinking about the next novel. I've got ideas for the next one and the one after that. And and I think, you know, it, it, you have to want it. Mm. If you don't want it enough, you're not going to push yourself to do it because it is hard work particularly yeah. if you're on the um, novel a year um, schedule. Yeah. It is hard work. Um, yeah. I know we'll be talking to Adele about that, but, you know, it, it's it's something that, um, it's, it, career longevity, yeah, and also perhaps, um, yeah, you do have to make certain sacrifices, I mm -hmm. think. And, of course, someone who knows a lot about career longevity is today's guest, the wonderful and phenomenal Adele Park. So let's welcome Adele onto the show. Yay. Hello Adele and welcome to In Suspense. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us today. And uh, before we dive into the, the discussion, I'm going to read out your bio. Oh, good. <laughs> are you ready? Adele Park's MBE is the author of 22 best-selling novels, including the recent Sunday Times hit and Audible number one sensation, One Last Secret. Over 4 million UK editions of her work have been sold and she has translated into 31 different languages. Her number one bestsellers, Lies, Lies, Lies and Just My Luck were both shortlisted for the British Book Awards and have been optioned for development for TV. 13,000 plus five-star reviews have kindly been written by her fans on Amazon. She is an ambassador of the National Literacy Trust and the Reading Agency, two charities that promote literacy in the UK, and she is a judge for the Costa Awards. Adele was born in North Yorkshire and has lived in Botswana, Italy and London, and is now settled in Guildford, Surrey. In 2022, she was awarded an MBE for services to literature. Her latest book, One Last Secret, was out this summer, and it's a cracker. I absolutely loved it, Adele, as I have loved all your books from the very beginning. Um, but can you tell us, in a nutshell, please, what One Last Secret is all about? Yes, I can. Uh, lovely intro. Thank you very much. One Last Secret is um, 
uh, narrated first of all by a sex worker. Let's just get this out there, tell everybody. And she has accepted one last job before she gives up her very dangerous uh, lifestyle. It happens to be in the south of France in a beautiful, luxurious uh, chateau. It ought to be a really straightforward job. She only has to uh, pretend to be a platonic girlfriend. She doesn't have to have even any intimate relations with the, the, the client. But in fact, when she gets to the chateau that is remote, she discovers nothing is what it seems and it is far from one last job and she can't leave her past behind her. And that's about all I can tell you, I think. Very Amazing. exciting. Um, and I absolutely loved it as well. Um, Dora's character was absolutely fascinating. I could have just read a book where we just followed her around and listened to her mindset on things and what she thought of things. But in, and, and you did that, but also you threw us into this fantastic premise where we didn't know what was going on, um, constantly guessing. Um, so I absolutely loved it. Um, and I wondered um, what made you write a character who works in the sex industry? Because you don't see that very often well that's exactly it lauren um in uh, my genre in you know psychological thrillers or crime or suspense any of those you do find sex workers but they're invariably either already dead mm -hmm. in the alleyway or they're sort of just somebody nameless that's in the background maybe gyrating around a, a pole at a lap dance club or something and i just thought you know what those people have a voice those women have stories what's their story um, and I often write from the very first novel I ever wrote, I often write heroines that are a, a little unexpected and perhaps a little bit harder to like. And it is hard to sympathise with a sex worker um, because, you know, the vast majority of us have no, um, we, don't, we don't meet sex workers and we don't know what they're up to. We don't know why they made those choices. So I actually thought that was something very underexplored and I would be offering my reader something fresh. And also me, a huge challenge of balancing this act of, you know, writing somebody who's, you know, fundamentally unsympathetic and asking my readers to go with her and, and be on her journey. And, and you do that so well. And that is my next question about that exact thing, that balance. Um, because you have got the she has got some unlikable qualities like some of her thoughts are quite um quite harsh um but I was all in with her completely as well um, and so I wondered and was it difficult to strike that balance of uniqueness and likability um well it's funny you said you could hear her voice and you'd like to just walk around with her because her voice came to me quite, I mean we can talk if you like about how I researched that profession and whilst I was researching it her voice did come to me and of course she's not going to be sweetness and light because people let her do that job mixed with some incredibly cruel uh selfish um brutal people who think money can buy anything because let's face it they have sold what many of the rest of us think of as something incredibly precious and the, the same act, sex, can be making love or it can be quite brutal. And she's really only been at the brutal end of it. So yes, she's unlikable. Yes, she's um, harsh in many ways. And that's only part of her journey. I mean, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but you know long because you've read it, but um, she has a, a very sympathetic backstory. Um, so I purposely provided her with that so, because obviously people don't just wake up one day I think the first line is you know nobody dreams of becoming a sex worker nobody does they end up there they land there because of the lack of choices as time goes on and so there was partly that she had a, a complex backstory that I think will take the reader with them and secondly I did take a gamble I put her in first person which means she was being very direct with you but she was confiding in you the way our friends confide in us and sometimes People, even people we love a lot, don't do exactly what we want them to do. Um, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it, as readers, how often we want to like the people we're reading about. Where, in fact, in real life, there's so many people we do love and like, and there are obviously lots of people we don't like. If, if that wasn't the case, the world would be much more simple and there'd be no war. Um, but, you know, I, so I wanted to kind of wrap all that up, but it was a balance. That's the challenge. It was the fun of it as well. It's the fun of it. It's the intellectual challenge of it. And I think actually it's why it appeals. People know what being nice is. 
but the vast majority of us consider ourselves quite nice. And the vast majority of us try quite hard to be decent people. So that's perhaps not that interesting to read about. Perhaps it's more interesting to read about people that we're a contrast to. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And you mentioned just then about research. And I know you take, <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. Um, I know you take your research very seriously. And for previous books, you've sometimes carried out the job of your protagonist. I think you worked in a florist once. I can't remember what novel that was for, but I've heard that. <laughs> That's true, yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, so um, dare I ask how you researched this one? Um, well, I'm... You're absolutely right. I mean, I quite often shadow. So I... Um... You know, I've, I've shadowed in uh, the teaching profession, I've shadowed in TV, um, as uh, I, I ask a lot of questions. I didn't shadow in, in a bank, but I once had a bank, an investment banker as one of my characters, and, had, and spent weeks working with an investment banker trying to understand what they do, which I'm still quite vague on. <laughs> so, um, so when it came to this character, all my friends who know this about me, they know I research this way, they said, well, you can't really shadow a sex worker Adele. And it's absolutely true. Of course, I couldn't shadow them. But I did think it was essential that I met and talked with sex workers in exactly the same way as if I was writing about a policewoman. I would I would and do meet with police people and have those conversations. So um, we always giggle in my house that um, you mentioned I live in Surrey, very nice part of the world, you know, very sort of law abiding citizens, all that. But if you look at my Google search, that would be doubted because my Google search does have things like, you know, uh, where can you illegally procure, procure a gun or, you know, which which drugs can, uh, you know, knock people out and for how long and how much you have to give them and when you have to give them and all these strange things. And the most strange thing, I think, perhaps on my Google search is escorts near me. So I take that in. And actually, it turns out they're very near me. They're very near me. I think very near you, all of us. That's the whole point. Um, and so I sent off some emails to these uh, messages to these women. Uh, there's an app and you, you can message them. And I just explained who I was, told them to go on my website, explained the kind of tone I use in my books and explained that I would have, you know, I would like to meet them. And because I wanted to represent them fairly. And in the end, I chatted to um, three different sex workers. Uh, hilariously in Guildford High Street at the coffee shop that I normally meet with my school mums. Um, so quite a different vibe, but in many ways, you know what, just women doing a job balancing their lives. Fantastic. Amazing. Did you do all that research before you actually started the writing or do you do it while you're writing? How do you... How do you... I try and do your more research beforehand. You, invariably something comes up and I think, oh gosh, I don't really know the answer to that. But with these, because it was... Comp- uh, uh, you know, if you're writing about being a teacher, we all have an experience of teaching because we've all been children, been to school or we might have children that are at school. Mm-hmm. So you can sort of have a fair guesswork at it. But with something like this, I didn't understand how they kept themselves safe, um, secure, sane. I wanted all that sort of research up front and it helped inform the voice. I do this particular little trick with um, developing characters which is before I start writing, I interview them. I have a whole host of questions, like literally about 200 questions. I don't ask them all the questions, but I ask questions to start playing with this character and really get to know them. And with Dora at one, so the questions might be, you know, what's your favorite outfit? Have you got a favorite sibling? Um, What's your best memory? And one of the questions I asked Dora quite early on in the process was, um, what's the moment you're most ashamed of? And she snapped back at me, oh, we don't know each other well enough for me to tell you that yet. And I thought, oh gosh, that's her voice, that, that's her voice. And I think actually that came from interviewing one of the girls who was mo- most reluctant to talk about her world and how she ended up. So two of, two of the three were very clear about how they ended up and what the choices were. The third was a bit more cagey and I thought, ah, that's, that's interesting, that, that's how my character is going to be. So all of the research before the book helps inform the book for me. Mm, fantastic. So interesting. Um, now, our topic today, Adele, is career longevity and adapting to the market. Um, and this is your 22nd novel in 22 years, I believe, um, which is just mind blowing. So how <laughs> Have you managed to maintain that level of commitment and discipline? You know, have there been sacrifices that you've made along the way in order to achieve that success? 
I think if I'm honest with myself, and this is something I'm only really coming to terms with and being honest with since I've become an empty nester, I think two things, I think my hobbies really took a slamming. I don't have, I didn't have until I became an empty nester, time for myself. I had a career and I had a child. And, you know, that that was plenty, that I'm very blessed to have both of those things and they're amazing. Um, but it did mean I didn't really, I, I gave up being, going to the gym, I gave up sports. I, I don't see my friends that often. I think my friends would be the first to say that about me. And I, and I know when I first wrote Playing Away and I had a full-time job, I, I always joke that I gave up ironing and soap operas, which I think is true, I did. But I did, I was in my 20s, late 20s, and I also remember being invited out to the pub and to parties and saying, no, I'm, I'm staying in and writing. And I think from quite early on, that's what I have done. So I, I do think you only have so many hours in the day and there's only so much you can do. But the counter to that is I love what I do. I'm, I'm, I wanted to do this from being a little girl and I'm absolutely blessed that I can do it. So it doesn't really feel grueling and it doesn't feel like an enormous sacrifice. In fact, again, my friends probably won't thank me for saying this, but quite often I like being in and writing and they have to drag me out. You know, they, they sort of point out, you know, you love it when you get there, Adele. And I'm like, oh, but you know, it's cold and wet out there and the book's in here. Um, uh, so it hasn't been this dreadful sacrifice by any stretch of the imagination. I love getting up every day and doing what I do. I do work in, in a very disciplined way. I sort of work at least five days a week when my, he's 22, my son now, but when he was little, obviously 22 books, 22 years, my kid's 22. When he was a tiny baby, I used to sort of just write seven days a week because I would only write whenever he was asleep or, you know, somebody else who's in childcare or whatever it might be. Um, so I wasn't, you know, I would work around him where once he went to school, I was very much Monday to Friday term times and then could down tools, which is a joy, really. Not many women get that or men, parents, not many parents get that level of flexibility. Um, so I can't grumble at all. But I think you hit the key, hit the nail on the head earlier when you just said you really wanted it and you love it. Because we were, Lauren and I were talking earlier in the introduction about what it takes to have such a long career in writing. And I, I think I said, you know, you have to want it. You have to be driven and really enjoy it. I am incredibly driven person. And, um, and I hate waste of time. I mean, I can't bear it. I get very, very agitated. You know, people who go to the gym a lot and then they stop going to the gym and they feel quite agitated. I'm like that if I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. And there are certain times in my career now that I realize I can't write because I might be on tour or, you know, and I'm, uh, or I'm promoting in a different country and there's time differences and all that sort of thing. And I know after a few days, certainly into a week, I start to get agitated if I haven't been writing. I write on holiday. I love it. I think the other thing to the, the longevity of my career is I'm quite flexible. Um, I started in one genre, which was sort of some people call it romantic comedy, some people really infuriating call it chiclet. At the time, I thought I was writing a family drama. I wrote about a woman who was having an affair, uh, first unlikable woman of many that I wrote about, um, but very relatable, everyone loved her. And, um, and I wrote sort of in that genre for sort of, I would say about nine books. And then I started writing what I would call more issue-based family dramas, where it would be maybe more about somebody with a sandwich generation dealing with a parent with Alzheimer's or somebody recovering from cancer, but always with a sort of mix of what's going on in the family, what's going on in their relationships. Then I wrote historical and now I write um, psychological and I've kept myself interested by changing genre. And I assume I've kept my, um, my, my readers interested in some way. Mm -hmm. 
That is so heartwarming to hear how you did it. And I, I've certainly, I'm sure Leslie's the same. Bells are ringing in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, I don't see my friends as much. They always moan at me about it, but I love it too much. Like I'm always first to go home early because I don't want to hang over because I know I want to write the next day, all that kind of thing. It's just, it is a level of commitment, but it's it's driven by passion. It isn't driven by like a ball and chain. You, you, you just want it so much and you just love it. So it's really yes. great to hear that. I mean, I just wonder if you could give us a little bit of insight into how you started your writing career like you mentioned that was it during maternity leave that you started writing playing away no I um before then so I as I mentioned I always wanted to be a writer from being a little girl it was suggested to me by a librarian when I was about seven or eight um and that was because I read a lot and she pointed out to me oh you read more than any other little girl I know and um, do you think one day you might want to be an author and I was a little bit horrified because I didn't understand the word author and she sort of had to explain that it was a writer. And it was the first time it had crossed my mind that a writer was a job, that there was a real life person writing that story that ended up in a book. I don't think I'd understood or even given any thought to how you got a physical book. So from then on, I started writing. But um, I, I come from North Yorkshire. I come from a family that we didn't know any writers or anyone in publishing. In fact, we always joke that the first pub the first writer I ever met was me. <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, there was, in those days, there wasn't any, there wasn't the same festivals. There obviously wasn't any social media. Um, I didn't know how to go about this career. So once I left university and I was the first um, generation in my family to go to university. And once I left, there was very much a feeling of, okay, you've had this privilege of going to university. You must get a job. Stop faffing around, talking about wanting to be a writer, go and get a paid job. So I did. I started working in advertising and um, for many years did really well at that and enjoyed it. All the way along, still reading and writing. My writing I refer to as scribbling, which I think, again, anybody who is um, an un, as yet unpublished writer will completely relate to that, understand that this is shyness. You never want to sort of say, oh, I'm a writer. And you, Come, everything I'm writing is interesting because you don't know if it is and you don't know if anyone will ever find it interesting. So I called it scribbling. Anyway, sadly, in my late 20s, when uh, I thought life was quite charmed and I was uh, newly married and um, uh, quite sort of, I felt very prosperous. I was living in London. We had two salaries coming in, no children. Um, but then very, very sadly, in the first year of our marriage, um, we experienced a lot of family deaths and friends' deaths in a very short period and a high number. And I was completely uh, blown away, I suppose. I, I just felt unstable. I felt the world was untrustworthy from, looked around at all my friends in the 20s who were having a blast and still felt very carefree and seemed... Uh, light ways away from what I was experiencing and I went to see a grief counsellor which now would be so the norm but then was seen as oh what well, a girl's absolutely losing it you know she's gone to see a counsellor but in fact it was one of the best things I've ever done in my life and I, I strongly recommend people turn for external help if they possibly can anyway I went to see a grief counsellor and she talked to me about taking control of some little part of my life that I alone not dependent on friends or family or husband or anyone, but I alone could make myself happy. And she said, that might be baking or gardening or something, a little, little something you do. And I eventually said to her, oh, well, I scribble. And she said, well, what do you mean? And I pulled out of my bag this sort of big fat notebook full of my writings and my jottings. And she said, oh, how many of those have you got to down? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe 20, maybe more. She said, oh, I think it might be more than scribbling. Um, and she said, just do a bit more of that. But I'm quite the girly swat. And when she said that to me, I thought that and the people dying combined, I thought, you know what, you got one life. And I've talked about this all my life. And I was only, you know, 28 at the time, but I thought I was, you know, heading for 30, which now is a baby. I see that. 53, I see 30 as a baby. But at the time, I remember thinking that was a deadline. And I decided I would write my first novel by the time I was 30. And in, in fact, I absolutely did. I submitted it to an agent on my leave of my 30th birthday. Um, and so, yes, it came out of starting my career literally came out of adversity, which I think is quite often the case with, with writers. 
Oh, that's fascinating. It's brilliant to hear that. And I believe that you I, you have a funny story to tell about how your first novel, you were, you, you were almost turned down by Johnny, the amazing Johnny Geller, who I know is your agent. So yeah. can you tell us that story? Because it's very funny. It was, yeah, it was. I mean, so I, I left it on his desk, uh, the first three chapters and a synopsis on the eve of my 30th birthday I didn't know Johnny Geller I didn't know Curtis Brown I didn't you know I looked it up in the writers and artists handbook and decided that was the person I was going to approach um and I came I went to the north to North Yorkshire celebrated my 30th came home and there was a light flashing on my answer machine and it was Johnny saying I love these three chapters it's amazing um can can you send me the rest let's talk Monday and I want to see the rest and on Monday I lied I said, he said, is it ready? And I went, yes. And it wasn't. And I kind of knew it wasn't, but I hadn't really expected him to even take any interest. I thought he'd say, no, but this part's interesting or this isn't, or maybe you should shape it this way. And I thought it would be a sort of ongoing process. No, no, no. I sort of panicked and said, and and I'm quite the people pleaser. I didn't really want to let him down. So I said, yes, it's it's ready. And he said, oh, can you send it to me? And I said, oh, I'm going on holiday for two weeks. Another lie. Um, I can send it to you in two weeks. So then I took two weeks off work, took all my holiday off work, very inconveniently for work, because I just literally said, I'm taking holiday. Worked around the clock, sort of pulled into shape all the other bits of writing I had and had sent it to him two weeks later. And uh, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And then I rang him and I kept bringing him back. And eventually he said, oh, well, you know, Adele, I thought the first three chapters showed real promise, but it feels a bit rushed to me. And of course it was. So he said, it feels a bit rushed to me. So it's not for me. Here's some names of other agents. You could go and visit them. It might be right for them. Or you could redraft and come back to me. And interestingly, and I think this says a lot about my personality, I did not see that in the slightest bit as a rejection. I saw that as very encouraging. Because I thought, first of all, he's clever enough to know it was rushed. And secondly, he has said I can resubmit. So I just took three more months and carried on with a bit more of a steady pace. And I redrafted and then sent it to him again. And that time he accepted it and he sent it out and it actually got six publishing houses and you all accepted it and they went into a bidding war. But the interesting thing about that is for many years, uh, I've talked to Johnny, many years later, I talked to Johnny about that. And he said to me, um, he often sent that note or relatively often sent that note asking people to resubmit. And until that point, nobody ever had. Yeah. And in his career, at the point I was talking to him, which, you know, was a while back even now, he said only two people ever have, it, and one of them was someone else I advised to send it. I told her this story and said, no, you must resend. That's quite encouraging. But only, isn't that interesting? People uh, move on. See it as know. a rejection when it isn't. Yes. <laughs> yes, and I think we're all very quick to sort of furl back up in our little balls and, and I'll run away, roll away. And actually, especially with writing, you all you have to grow a very tough skin. And you know, you have to see wins when perhaps there aren't even any there and, and go for it. And it worked. It worked for well, me. thank goodness. Thank goodness yeah. you did I submit. And the rest was history. Yes. <laughs> a long history, yes. Um, now you mentioned um earlier that you started off in um family dramas or um chiclet, as some people call it, and you've also written historical. And what prompted you to make the move to psychological thrillers? Was it like a, a conscious decision? I'm now gonna write a psychological thriller. Or was it much more, this is the character and this is the story and, oh, it falls into a different genre? Yeah, definitely the latter. I mean, the, the, the historical w- was the, the big change, I think. So the historical, I really consciously, obviously, you can't slip into historical. You have to do quite a lot of research to get into her historical. And I had a couple of ideas that I wanted to write those stories. And actually, I wrote... I I sort of wrote a novel a year and then while I was researching my historical which took about four years of research then wrote the two historical and uh, because they're set in World War One which was such a brutal time and obviously I wrote about you know war and death on a huge scale I felt after I'd finished those two stories I simply couldn't go back to one family and one sort of family with a sort of normal little drama. It just didn't seem enough for me. It didn't seem meaty enough. So I wrote a relationship book that got turned dark 
I was only when I handed it in that my editor sort of said, oh, this is quite dark. And I said, is it? And I, and I thought, well, I said, oh, it is quite dark. And there were sort of two books that are almost hybrid books where sort of uh, it's starting to get dark, but I, I, I pull back. I still offer that happy ending at the end. And then, uh, yeah, I, so I sort of was moving that way. And it's so much fun. You know, the, the plots for psychological thrillers are so much fun because you really have to think of the twists and turns. And I've always been interested in twists and surprising the reader. Even in my very, very early books, that there's nearly always a twist at the end. And so it just seemed my natural home. And the more I did it, the more I was marketed that way, the more I was marketed that way, the bigger my audience is because interestingly um i found this is only anecdotal there's no research to back this up but i feel that men are more comfortable reading psychological thrillers written by women than they are perhaps re reading relationship dramas written by women mm -hmm. men might read a um i don't know david nichols which is a relationship drama because it's written by a man but they wouldn't necessarily read the state we're in which is written by me uh, but they would read a psychological thriller written by a woman because they think that was kind of more of a, a male subject. Mm. I don't know. But anyway, whatever the reason, my audience grew and it just seemed to be a very comfortable place. And I mean, interestingly, my contract doesn't specify what genre. Ooh. I know, I know. I always think, gosh, they're, they're trustworthy. Science fiction oh. next then, Adele, is yeah, it? Well, yes, they're very trustworthy, aren't they? I mean, I think science fiction is about the only one I wouldn't want to do. Right. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, I think, I, yes, I, I certainly know that 2023's books are uh, psychological drama, because I've already written it. I know 2024's is, because I'm currently writing it. And I know 2025's is, because I know that story. Oh. So I think we're safe for a while, yeah. <laughs> Certainly very safe in your hands then. Um, now, I think our listeners would like to know, and I, I certainly know that we would, um, what advice you have on creating career longevity as an author and doing it as successfully as you have? Um, well, I think the one we first mentioned is that you really have to want it and you have to put the hours in. And it's interesting. I have seen over the years many, many people who want to become writers and some people put a timeline on it and they say, oh, if I am in six months, then I am. And if I'm not, I'm walking away from it. And it's very unlikely to hit that first timeline. Um, but there does need to be a level of resilience um, and persistence. I think both of those things, even whilst writing, certainly a level of discipline. I think anybody with any long career will tell you that you just keep going. Mm -hmm. You keep going when there's knockbacks. You keep going when there's successes. Um, you don't really let either one of those things, well, I haven't let either one of those things affect my working week. So if I have a dreadful week and things, all, you know, it doesn't seem as though the sales are happening and it doesn't, you know, not getting any notice or awards or reviews or whatever it is you're chasing, just keep writing because that is, that is the answer. And equally, if it's a week where I've gone to number one and people want to throw film deals at me and it all seems marvellous, just keep writing <laughs> because both of those things will come and go and none of those things what it's really about what it really is about for me <clears throat> is the words on the page that will or will not make a connection with someone and I hope mine do mm -hmm. and I think that's what the longevity is about understanding other people and wanting to connect with other people mm -hmm. Oh, that's excellent okay. advice. I think our listeners will be lapping that up. Thank yes, you. I know I am. So just to say that I've just found that such an inspiring answer and makes me feel so motivated. Thank you, Adele. Oh, you're welcome. Now, you mentioned earlier that you started off in the advertising industry. And um, I was wondering whether the experience of working in, in advertising helps you when it comes to hooks and pitches. I know we don't always write the pitches ourselves, but sometimes we do. We have to sort of, you know, um, suggest books to editors and things. Has that helped you, do you think, having that sort of the, 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 the immediate sort of language and the pitch? Yeah, I think it might have. And my job in advertising, funny enough, wasn't writing the adverts. My job was, I was the account manager, so I was the sort of, organized one that communicated between the sort of 
I don't know, media planners, media buyers, creatives. That's definitely helped in my career because I'm very aware that I might write the book, but there are dozens, endless actually, other hugely professional, talented people that produce the book. So the people that design the cover, that edit, that um, uh, market, that think of, that buy media, that sell the book into the retailers. So I think one of the important things I did learn is to have the confidence in those people. I don't see the publishers as a them and us situation. And I sometimes hear authors who talk as though it is a them and us situation. They're quite sort of untrusting of the publishers. And I, I want to say to them, you know, don't worry, they want the same as you. They want this book published as well as it possibly can. They want to sell as many possible uh, copies as they possibly can. So I think that was quite a useful experience. I do have quite a good ear for a, a hook. I don't come up with all of them, like you, exactly like you said, Leslie, that there's, I come up with some of them, my editor comes up with others, market, the marketing department come up with others, but we're all very respectful of one another and very cooperative with one another. And we're willing to say, oh my gosh, no, you're right. Your idea is the best idea. Yes. And even when I sort of worked with a title all the way along and then my editor very politely says, I'm not sure about that title. I have to go, okay, what's, what's your solution? <laughs> what, you know, where are you with it? And I don't really mind that. I think that's, you know, we work as writers, don't we work on our own a lot. So mm. the actual publishing pro part of the process is fun if you allow it to be collaborative. And yeah, I, that, that can be a great joy, actually. So, so sort of following on from that, how important is it, do you think, for authors to um, do a, a, a you know, as much of their own marketing, perhaps the wrong word, promotion alongside the work that their publishers are doing. You know, you said it's collaborative, but, you know, because publicists, you know, they have so many books to publish, but publicise and they're probably the focus is around the publication dates, isn't it? So do you, how important is it for you to continue to publicise yourself and promote your own work throughout the whole year? I think it's, I think it's very important to do as much as you're comfortable with. So I think that's the important thing. There are some incredible authors who are brilliant writers and sell shed loads, but do not want to do any social media, don't want to put themselves out there, don't want to make personal articles. And that, that is 100% a person's right. Um, I, uh, I do quite a lot of social media. I don't, um, I love I, I, I love doing it myself. I don't have anybody running my social media account. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's just me. Um, all the comments come to me. I respond to those comments. Any emails I receive, I respond. There's not a third person involved, which I think builds up a trust between me and my readers because they know they can tell me their own personal stories and they're only going to me. And I think that's important. Equally, I feel I have a level of responsibility to my readers. So of example I don't overexpose myself so in this early summer we lost our cat and I was devastated she died and I thought I oh, well, I wanted to post about it because I wanted lots of people to say I'm so sorry but then I thought mm, today somebody might have lost their parent or their child or and I just thought it was the wrong thing to do so I didn't do it now when we got kittens literally this weekend I said We've got kittens because this is good news and I can deliver good news. And I did say, still miss my cat. And that's what I mentioned. And a few people said, oh, gosh, I haven't known she's gone. Um, so I think it's just finding out what works for you. So I allow people into my private life to an extent. Everybody knows I have one husband. <laughs> I've had two, but one at a time. One husband and one child. And, you know, um, when it's my dad's birthday or my mom's birthday, I'll post a picture of their cakes, that kind of thing. But on the whole, I don't bring, I, I don't um, overexpose, overshare. I think I share in my books. I think I'm very honest in my books. And that's where I make the connections. And that's what I want to direct people to. So I want people to know they've got a relationship with me. I want them to remember that I'm there all year round. But I also don't want to push my books down their throat the whole year round. So that's why I might talk about my cat or my husband. Or yeah. It's just getting the balance. And it's yeah. just doing what feels comfortable for you. I have seen people that I personally have thought, right, you're overdoing it now. 
please step back you know I, every time I put on my feed of you know and it could be a really good friend and you still think gosh all right I know every single moment of my life I don't need it um and I think there are some evils of you know on, on social media I personally never had any they've been I think it can be quite a delightful place to be but I th- so I think being prepared to do some level of work like certainly social media but actually you know what I think is the best if you're prepared to go to your library and do events and do I do endless events that people don't even know about um talk to schools and you know that level of work and promoting because if you talk to a school because you're talking to their sixth formers for instance about how to fill out a, a, a university application or something like that or just even inspiring them to tell them they should fill out a university form they might go home and tell their mom and dads and then their mom and dads next time they're in the library might pick up your book and yeah. it's that kind of thing is also super important yet I wouldn't really say that was me marketing but I suppose it is part of my process it is part of being a writer that's inter- really interesting that, that really is interesting um and you you do a lot for kids and literacy um and you were recently awarded an mbe for your services to literature which is just so phenomenal i mean huge congratulations adele um, how did you first find out about this you know was it a complete surprise it was a complete surprise i mean this is something that really was a me and this um, so my son was studying languages. He was actually studying Russian uh, in Russia. And to go and visit him, my husband and I had to fill out this endless, like 25 pages long visa form, filling out all sorts of personal details. And while we were in Russia, I got this email saying, you've got an MBA. And I thought, that's spam, isn't it? Because I was in Russia and I'd just given them all this information about myself. I just honestly thought, oh, that's spam. And the year before I clicked on a link and lost lots of files in fact all my files and so I'm terrified so I just deleted it straight away didn't even mention it to anyone got home from that trip got the email again deleted it and didn't think anything I literally not for a second did I think that could be real I just I didn't have a clue and then um eventually I got a phone call from Curtis Brown saying Adele you really need to reply you've five hours left even if you don't want it it's the polite thing to say no and I said, oh, well, what? And they went, this MBE. I was like, of course I want it. Is it real? And even then, I honestly thought it, I was only being nominated. And I thought, oh, at the end of the year, and they might say no. But no, I, they were saying, no, this is, Dece- I think it was about the December the 9th. And they were saying, no, you'll be in the New Year's Honours list. I couldn't. It was literally was and still is probably the most proud making career moment I've ever had. I can't. I had no idea anybody was kind of noting what I was doing or bothered or yeah so it was lovely the really lovely thing that's that's wonderful all that hard work um outside of writing is obviously really paid off so congratulations again thank you it's so amazing it's so weird because you obviously when you do those things you don't think oh one day I'll get I'm doing it yeah yeah you just don't well I never thought I never thought of it but it has been the most extraordinary experience. And I only picked it up last week. I literally, so it's still very fresh for me. It's very exciting. Are you making all your family and friends refer to you now as Adele Park's MBE? MBE. <laughs> um, actually, one of my friends bought me a necklace with MBE round. Oh, yeah, I love it. Another friend bought me a cocktail shaker that has MBE engraved. My friends clearly know me quite well because another one bought me a champagne glass with MBE <laughs> engraved. So I think we all know where I uh, where my weaknesses lie. Oh, wonderful! Um, now we well, I actually keep forgetting to use it. I'm, I'm trying to remember. When I get new credit cards and but bank cards, I must remember to put it on. Oh yeah, yeah, you should. <laughs> um, now we're coming to the end of the show. We have one more question for you, which we like to ask all our guests, which is, "What are you reading at the moment, or what have you just read? Is there anything you'd like to recommend to us?" Oh, that's really good. I can show you because it's literally sat here. Oh yay! Yes, so I just read Patrick Gale, Mother's Boy. Mother's Boy, and, oh, that's uh, interesting. I met Patrick, um, oh, many, many years ago. I met Patrick at a library event in Newcastle, probably about 18, 19 years ago. And then never saw him again, but watched his career and read his books. And then I bumped into him at Liverpool Festival. We did that together a few weeks ago, probably a month ago now. And um, I, I bought a signed by author copy because I always do that whenever I'm out with any of my 
any other author from. I've got lovely shelves with lots of signed by author things. And actually read that and it's it is set between the wars. It's it's that generation where the father is in First World War and the son is in Second World War. And I find that a fascinating mm. period of time, especially from the, the wife and then the yeah. mother's view. So I just read that by Patrick and um, yeah. And I, I, I have um, a review column in a glossy magazine and um, may I say the name of the magazine? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I do a review column in a Platinum magazine and mm. I it's sort of book club reads and they don't have to be new. They can be something I read a long time ago that I'm still interested in or whatever. And actually, um, so I review about six books a month. So I try and read about 10 books a month um which is is a lot but anyway that's that I finished literally two days ago amazing and what about you Leslie have you been reading anything um, that is a lot well I've yeah I'm actually not reading at the moment because I I've been so focused on getting my draft done and I felt really guilty actually because I had to say no to some proofs and things and I did really want to read them but I just knew that I had to just focus on on my book but I tell you what I had picked up which was sent to me ages ago um and that was um which I might have talked about on the show sort of before saying that I'd got it was that um, Tim Weaver's The Blackbird which oh, I, I love really that love. I love I'm loving it and so I'm finding that a lot of novels I was sent earlier in the year I'm now starting to sort of pick up again um so hopefully once I finish this draft which should be Christmas hopefully I will then have a get really back into my reading and and, and I'm not sure I'll be able to read 10 a month that's no, very impressive I, I, I totally understand what you're saying and there are times when I think you know, this is really tricky that I'm having to review when I actually want to stay in mm. my own my own mm. book and my own moment, you know, and I, I know what you mean about voices or voices come in and yeah. it's distracting, yeah. Is what it, about you Lauren what well are you reading? similarly um I could blame the fact that I was obviously trying to finish my book for why I haven't been reading as much but it was actually the fact that I'm a celebrity's been on and we watch <laughs> it as a family but like I normally go to, up to bed about eight and I'll just read for an hour and a half before bed every night it's like my time to read because we've been watching I'm a Celebrity I haven't been reading as much we just I've hated it I'm so pleased it's so far um but I have read um a really early proof of Silent Waters by L.V. Matthews and um, which is coming out next year um it's absolutely just a gripping intensity um fantastic thriller so one to watch out for next year I was really pleased to get an early copy and I must give her a quote for that um so yeah that is what I've read so yeah but now I'm a celebrity done with I'm back on it with the reading so I'm really excited <laughs> well sadly that's all we've got time for Adele it's been brilliant talking to you you've been inspirational and yeah. uh we yeah I'm sure our listeners and viewers because some people watch us on YouTube <laughs> are going to really enjoy this one we we certainly have yeah um, I loved it you're both lovely it flew oh. by Thank you. And uh, so everybody, Adele's latest book, One Last Secret, it's out right now. And I think, is the paperback out next week? Uh, paperback's out on the 8th of December. Paperback out on the 8th of December. So do read it, folks, because it is absolutely brilliant. And um, I just will say that I listened to it, actually, as an audiobook, and it was brilliant. So if you like listening to audiobooks, then that's a really great one. To hear Dora's voice in your head was absolutely amazing. Yeah, I sometimes read and read a book and listen to it sort of, you know, I, I might read a few chapters and then listen to the next few chapters. It depends mm. what I'm doing. But yeah, that's a great way to listen, isn't it? Yeah, I love that. Um, so in our next and final episode, Graham Bartlett will be sharing his final pieces of advice on policing for authors. Mm -hmm. And we then have one more interview for this year, and it's all about busting the myths of digital digital publishing. I can never say digital. I don't know why. <laughs> busting the myths of digital publishing with Ruth Heald. And it's also our Christmas special. And so Lauren and our new presenter, Nikki Smith, and myself will all be presenting that together. So expect some festive attire, jumpers, perhaps, or yes. bauble earrings. I don't know. We'll, we'll surprise you on the day, Something. but yes. we're looking forward to that. <laughs> um, which leaves me with the final task of saying goodbye from Adele. Yes, and goodbye. And thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. And goodbye from Leslie. Bye-bye. And goodbye from me. Bye.